Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. For today, John and Kelly will be discussing the series, or discussing descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DIAnalytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the president and chief delivery officer at First San Francisco Partners. Also joining us is Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management. Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she first founded San First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello. Hope everyone is doing fine out there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be this day. Today we're talking about analytics in a bit of detail, uh, to be more precise, descriptive, predictive, uh, and uh, prescriptive uh, analytics. And today's uh, uh, offering will be uh, a bit on the educational side, a bit on the side of putting things in perspective with our uh, annual topic this year of data insight and analytics. Before that, we have a couple of our poll questions which we like to ask about this very dynamic and busy uh, discipline. So first of all, get your uh, mouses ready or your mice, whatever. What type of statistical analyses do you use or plan to use? And you can choose multiple answers. So we will allow this uh, about 30 seconds for this to go, and then we'll take a look at that and we will move on uh, to the next one. While everyone is uh, typing in uh, their answers there, um, uh, today you don't have to be a data scientist to listen to this today. In fact, we kind of uh, hope that you're one of those people that will be supporting them or thinking about supporting data scientists or peripherally involved or looking uh, over the cubicle wall at things and going, uh, I don't understand a lot of what's going on. But um, sometimes you feel like you should. And that's who we're kind of pointing our little uh, session at here uh, today. Um, we have, uh, I think, do we have an answer? Yes, we do. Um, and uh, uh, we have um, no answer uh, is the biggest one. Um, and we have a dead on tie between descriptive and uh, predictive. Uh, very, very uh, interesting findings there. Not too far away from I don't know. Um, okay. Let's go on to our next uh, question then. And if you don't want to answer, one, one of these weeks we're going to ask you why you don't want to answer. Then you're going to have to answer. All right, how frequently do you use statistical analysis in your work? So um, if you don't use it, put it there, less than once a week, once or twice, once a day, uh, whatever. Please answer that. And uh, we'll let the time race by uh, for, for that one uh, as well. Um, and then we will get uh, started here. Um, now, when I used to be in radio, this is where you did the weather forecast, but uh, it would be a whole lot of different weather forecasts at one time. So I think we're about ready to go here on the result, and we'll take a look at that, and uh, away uh, we go. Um, and we had some questions on the first, uh, uh, there were some, actually some questions for you, Shannon, on the first question. The poll didn't seem to work right. All right, do we have the second one ready to go here? I don't see the answer. I'll keep an eye on it, but we'll, we have, we'll get going. We have a lot here. To, there we go. Um, most of the people uh, uh, don't, um, don't, uh, aren't using them now. Okay, so that's very, very good. So we're in an educational mode today, and that's kind of what we were, we were thinking. So we're going to start with an overview, 
and a definition. And we're going to take a slightly deep dive into all three of these things, uh, which is what we're supposed to do. Um, and we're going to follow some examples. We're going to pick on the retail industry today because that's something that a lot of people understand. And then we're going to uh, hopefully give you folks some takeaways to uh, uh, take back with you uh, from uh, the end of this uh, webinar. So let's get going here. The process, let's just talk about the process, first of all, of statistical uh, analysis because we're, 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 we're um, uh, when you do this type of work, what you're really saying is we need an answer to something, but we don't have the resources to get all of the data and have a comprehensive understanding of the situation. So we're going to take a subset or, 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 and we're going to make statistical inferences. And there's a lot of different ways uh, to do that. Um, uh, no matter which way you do that, however, it, there is a sort of a method to this, and that is to have an, a hypothesis, um, and there is uh, two results of, of verifying your hypothesis, the null and the alternative. Um, we need to have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a data source, and then we need to prove our hypothesis. And I'm going to go over this process here just briefly. Uh, because the thought process is very important if you're trying to understand uh, this line of thinking and what data scientists are doing. I think, well, I think you'll find some surprises today versus some of maybe the common perceptions of, of uh, data science and statistical uh, analysis. So our first step here is the hypothesis. And the null means that, um, well, we think this is the answer, but we find out that any, anything there's a lot of chance in our, our uh, uh, answer. Um, and then, of course, the alternative is that uh, um, uh, uh, we do have irregularities, but they are going to have a bearing on, on our conclusion. Um, so what we're really trying to do here, I and mean, we're going to use a sample of a retail chain. And uh, the example we're going to use is we have a, 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 a we, we think, we think our hypothesis is that if we train our sales associates better, we'll get more sales. So we're going to have a sample of data uh, to do that. Um, and we're going to uh, think about how, what might happen here. Now, now it, if, if we have the uh, um, experiment one with a null uh, result of no difference in the amount sold between who trained and was trained, then we would say, okay, well, then it doesn't matter. But we might notice in one experiment or with our data that the difference in the amount sold, uh, there is some difference in the amount between uh, the people that uh, had some training um, and not. But, but at that point, we know that there's a difference. We don't know whether there was some type of, uh, um, uh, uh, whether that was good or bad, but we know that's a difference. In the second experiment, we kind of shift our, our view, our, our hypothesis that the salespeople did better. And we focus our results and our analysis on, on the fact that if we did train them, they sell more on average. So there's a difference between more sold and not knowing, um, just doing a comparison, and then having some type of indication that they sell more on, on some type of uh, average type to compare them. So the, the takeaway from this slide is with the hypothesis is you have to understand exactly what it is you're looking for. It isn't just that the answer is going to leap at you. You have to understand the type of answer that you're looking for. Secondly, is what are the appropriate data sources we don't want to develop? Now, first and foremost, yes, we're talking data insight and analytics this year. The, the theme is big data-ish, uh, uh, but that's not necessary. You can do uh, this with, and it has been done for many, many, many decades without big data. This uh, uh, big data was uh, preceded by many, many years by statistical analysis. So it's, it's also the data that you don't need. There is a tendency to collect every possible thing and then dive in and hope there's an answer, but the data scientist isn't going to look at everything all the time. There is going to be some setting aside of data to use. There might be consideration of external data. The key here, like any other data insight or analytics or BI or data warehouse, is what do you need it for? What condition is it in? What's it going to cost us to handle it and all of that? 
and all of those types of things. And that's kind of that's kind of an easy one for most of us data folks. And the last one is we have this hypothesis. We understand the type of null or alternative result that we're going to get. So now we have to figure out how we're confident. And this is where we get a little bit into statistics. You can have some incorrect conclusions if you don't have a realistic view of your confidence. So we're going to look at our example here, and we're going to pick a 95% confidence interval. Now, we don't ever pick 100% for our confidence level, because if we needed the data to be 100% certain, we wouldn't be doing statistical inference. We'd have to look at all the data and, and then have an absolute uh, firm uh, conclusion. So we're, what we're going to say here is if we can get within 95%, uh, we're going to accept that, and that's going to give us a bit of a, of a, of a um, margin of error or a margin for error, um, and uh, we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll be able to work within that. Uh, we have a couple of errors that can happen. We, we, we reject uh, something that we shouldn't have, or we don't reject, reject something we should have. Um, that takes some, uh, a little bit of training to understand how to do that, but uh, you're going to hear those terms with the data scientists. Um, uh, and, you know, the key here is which type of error is more detrimental to your investigation, and then you study your data uh, occur, uh, accordingly. Well, we'll just quick look at our example here, and then we'll just keep um, moving along, is, is with our confidence level, of nine, there's a lot of numbers on this slide, all right? You don't need to understand this whole slide. The, the key things here is you have 0 0.05. That's uh, something called the alpha. Notice that's 100 minus 95 gets you 0 0.05 or 5%. All right, and then the SIG two-tailed, that is um, through, through the analysis, um, we, this, if we don't exceed that 0 0.05 with whatever the SIG or um, um, difference is in, in, in the run of the variances here, we know that the data, because of some statistical theory, is, is proving our hypothesis. Now, again, we're not going to dive into all of, a lot of this in detail today. Just to show you that there's an example here that says that <clears throat> it looks like, wow, you know, if you look at the bar chart, if we train people, we're, we're going to get, we're going to get an uptick on sales. And that's, that's pretty good. Now, this doesn't take out common sense. Um, uh, common sense would be, well, at the same time we did this, uh, there was this wonderful new product and everyone flocked to the store to get the product. So you have to use common sense with this kind of stuff, but this is the beginning of, of understanding how this types of analysis uh, uh, work. So I'm going to just go over the top three real quick and then we're going to start to dive into them one at a time. Very, very briefly, descriptive analytics. So it uncovers uh, insight from uh, things that have happened. So, you know, what happened? Uh, we have a, some data, and we take a look at the data, and we look at what happened and have some deeper understanding there, and we call that descriptive. Then we have the next one, which is predictive, which is helps forecast behavior, uh, and that is what could happen. Now, what's interesting here is when you look at the market and the literature, Everything is called predictive analytics or advanced analytics right now. And what we're finding is that they're pretty much referring, using the term predictive analytics, many places to cover all three. It's important for you to know that there are shades within this advanced analytics world. Predictive is the second. The third is prescriptive and is what should be done. So we do some analysis and uh, um, some actions or activities are suggested by the result of that analysis. At this point, I am going to hand over uh, the descriptive topic to Kelly, catch a little beverage, a little drink, and uh, we'll go from, and then we'll pick up uh, from there. Kelly, take it away. Sure. So descriptive analytics are really the backbone of analytics, um, although as John mentioned, they don't really get much credit these days. Um, but really, descriptive analytics are generally a good starting point for further, more complicated analysis like predictive and prescriptive. And uh, while the findings of a descriptive investigation may not be as exciting as a complicated model, you wouldn't actually be able to complete the more complicated models or even know whether they're appropriate without descriptive analytics. So 
wanted to spend a minute talking about descriptive analytics because they are still very valuable. And if we look at the example uh, regarding the salespeople training, that was a type of descriptive analytics that was dealing with uh, means or averages. So what we're going to go through here is the uh, two primary types of descriptive analytics, and then we'll walk through another example, again, using a retail chain. So there's two uh, main types of descriptive analytics, measures of central tendency, which is what we saw in the previous example, and then measures of dispersion. So measures of central tendency, most people are familiar with and use commonly the mean or the average. And so that is the average, uh, um, in the previous example, it was the average sales per person. Uh, the median is the most common, uh, or sorry, no, the median is the middle of the road answer, and then the mode is the most common answer, so highest frequency. So the second type of uh, descriptive analytics are uh, dispersion. Measures of dispersion are range, so what's the minimum and maximum and the difference between the two. This essentially tells you the raw spread of the data. The variance is the difference um, or the average degree to which the points differ from the mean. So how similar or different are the representation in the data? And this essentially uh, tells you the difference between your max, not between your maximum and your minimum, but between the average and the tails. And then the standard deviation uh, is the most common way of expressing the spread of the data. Um, standard deviation is found by taking the square root of the variance. And uh, this is the most common way that people measure and, dis and uh, um, discuss the spread of the data set. Now, if we just take a quick example on the right-hand side of the screen, what we're looking at here is a buying analysis. Again, using very simple data, but as a way to express uh, what this descriptive analytics example might be. So in this instance, we are looking at uh, customers, the number of items purchased, and the amount spent in an effort to get to know our customers overall. And so we here we see that the mean or the average amount spent is $6.50. We find that the median amount spent and then the number of items that people purchased, which is um, most commonly people purchased one item. So uh, within this retail chain example, we can see that there's quite a big spread of the number of items purchased and our conclusions of our uh, customers might be swayed if we look just at the average amount spent and we don't understand the median or the mode. So in this instance, uh, there's, if we're looking at the number of items purchased, the number of items purchased are quite high on an average basis. But the most common purchase amount is just one item. And so this is where you can see where the measures of central tendency can give us a wide view, not just looking at the average uh, items purchased, but looking also at things like the median and the mode to learn, again, even more about our customers and their buying habits within this retail chain example. So with that, I am going to turn it over to John to talk a little bit about predictive analysis, and then we will continue to take examples of predictive analysis, and then lastly, prescriptive analysis as well. Thank you. And um, I could have predicted that this one was next. I'm sorry, that was a little bit of, um, when I took statistics in college, we definitely needed levity and we didn't have it. But we didn't get it there either, did we? Okay, predictive uh, uh, analytics. Um, so we, some folks, because of the name, go over predicting future uh, events. And that's not really what's happening here. It's more answering the question, what could happen based on the factors that we're, that we're uh, putting into some sort of model. 
Um, and so the models can be very simple by looking at the factors are very, very complex and crunching through a lot of things. But um, we're looking at what could happen. Um, the, the example here of a sentiment analysis. So, and, and we see this a lot now with uh, tweets um, and uh, uh, organizations going and uh, finding out in the morning that there's bad tweets or, or good tweets and, 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 and getting all that. So, um, you, and you can, you can start to say, well, if we do something this way, we're going to get a bad uh, uh, social media impression, things like that. Lots of models can be used here. Um, forecasting, simulation, regression, classification, clustering, and there are many, many, many more. We're going to take a look at just a handful of these uh, uh, just to give you an idea of what's uh, going on within these models. Remember the key here today is that uh, here's the kind of scenario we talked about when we put this together, that um, you're a data architect or a, a, a data engineer of some sort, and you're sitting in a kickoff meeting and all these words are flying around you. And um, this helps you figure out what, what folks are talking about because maybe as a data management person or a data governance person uh, <clears throat> or a BI person who's starting to look at uh, an environment where a lot more sophisticated things are going on, you might have something to contribute if you understand this uh, a little bit better. So that's kind of our mindset. If you have any questions, don't forget to enter them. We do leave time at the end to, as, as we try very hard to get to the questions and then write our answers and get those sent out. Um, the last week we broke our record. We had things turned around in about four or five hours. Okay, uh, forecasting, the first um, uh, uh, one here is just, the, you know, we all have seen this, kind of taking some points on a line and dot them up and then kind of extrapolate what that line would look like. And we take uh, the, the means of some various periods. Uh, one for four would say give us period five, and then two through five would six. We Well, we have kind of a, a rolling uh, set of means there. And then it smooths out. Notice our curve, the brown curve before the blue part is kind of jagged, but then the predicted part uh, is smoothed out, well, because some type of smoothing occurred there. Now, this is the thing with any forecasting, you're using past data to give a rough projection of the future. Well, the more data you have, for one thing here, um, uh, the, 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 the more variable that this can, this can uh, become. Um, I'm, when I, I'm sorry, when I said more data, it's like the period of time that you're, you're forecasting, okay? I mean, if I were to take this line and say, what's going to happen in 2050, we pretty much as rational people go, uh, too much is going to happen between now and then. So again, you have to use common sense here. But we're using past data to do. So what's our example here with the retailer? We kind of took some sales for store C. We plotted them. We, we uh, uh, did some type of smoothing a technique, and there's a bunch of those you can use, and you can try those out in Excel if you want. And we, we got our little line uh, pushed uh, out there into the future, into the years 17, 18, 19, and, and 20. Uh, the next uh, uh, technique here within predictive analytics is simulation. Now, uh, uh, and, and again, um, there's a lot of ways to do this. But what you're trying to do is, in a simple sample data fashion, run a model. It, it is what they say, it's simulation. Now, most of us are familiar with simulators, like in airplanes or, or climate simulations. And we see the result of really, really interesting models all the time on the evening news or the weather channel or something like that. So this is, this is in that ballpark there. The queuing model is a really good one. It's used a lot because it's wait time, queue length, Anyone who's been in a, uh, a um, uh, Costco or a Sam's or a grocery store of any sort and wondering uh, all of a sudden the lines go from five deep to two deep and they turn things on, somewhere someone has done some queuing, modeling, and a little indicator went off somewhere that it's time to open up some more lines. And, and there's been some uh, analysis behind that. The next is the discrete event model where we can um, – when you can't use queuing, we can go look for bottlenecks. And then the last one that we'll talk about is the Monte Carlo simulation, which is a very sophisticated type of simulation scenario type thing 
um, but it is used uh, a, a great deal. We're just going to look again at some examples here. Here are the queuing. So the takeaway here are on, are on the highlighted things. We have a situation here in our retail store where, where customers are arriving, and in certain scenarios, we have a wait time of 30 minutes. We go, oh, my gosh, we, that's, that's too long. Um, this might be, say, service in the layaway department or the automotive department or something like that. And we find we've got four people an hour. We can handle six an hour with two people. Uh, well, with one person, people are waiting. We add a person, but now the utilization goes way down. So you're paying people only one, to, to work one-third of the time. Well, we, we, that's another thing that we really can't uh, uh, handle. So we, we, we say, well, what if we just train people for more throughput and draw more out of, out of less people? So if I up the service rate to 10 an hour for the one server, that's scenario two, utilization does improve. The wait time does go down a little bit from 11.3 to 10. Uh, the probability that a customer waits does go up. However, that time they're waiting does go down. So you can see this is some way to help you make your decision. Notice, and this is what's the difference with, 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 where the name predictive is a bit of a misnomer. It's not telling you what's going to happen. It's telling you what can happen based on the data. You still need to make a decision based on this data. It's not a cut and dry answer. You're going to ask yourself a lot of questions like, how much do I invest in this training to increase the service rate? You know, um, uh, will this person quit if I make them work harder? Um, uh, uh, is there something else people can do if they're not helping a customer? If this, this utilization rate of 60% or 66%, well, can they be doing something else? There's a lot of, again, this is where common sense comes in, but this is a pretty uh, kind of cool way to break down and help you make your decision. Um, in, in, uh, and again, that's uh, what the queuing type of models do or really help give you a lot of Alternatives, of course, that's what predictive modeling does. It gives you a lot of these relationships. It tells you what could happen. It's not really predicting what will happen. Uh, the, the best example of this is the Monte Carlo simulation, where you have a lot of variables. And here we have a, um, a an example of um, uh, we're having our, our retail thing again, and we have um, all kinds of um, we're going to um, maybe build a new store. Well, should we build a new store? And here we have a, oh, maybe 20, 18 or 20 variables. Normally when you do these, there could be hundreds of variables. And we put in what are the ranges that we can tolerate. Um, and the simulation runs all, using random number generation, runs all kinds of uh, uh, permutations of this and uh, comes up with uh, what things would look like if all these things happen. Well, again, it gives you a bunch of data to look at but then you have to look at a particular scenario and say, oh, that's what's going to happen if all these other things happen. Um, this is a really cool one, and um, uh, uh, this is so cool and so in demand in some tools. It's an upcharge in other tools. It's uh, a much uh, requested feature for uh, statistical tools to have uh, within them. Uh, the last one is something, uh, we've got two more to go here. So real quick, regression. Um, regression analysis, it's, it's, it's one of these understanding your independent and dependent. So that's the old statistical conundrum of causality and correlation. So now we can start to get some things to maybe help us uh, work through that. So for logistics um, is a good one. Um, uh, you know, if our store is closer, will someone shop there? Will they go to the competitor? Um, you can look at linear relationships. Uh, for example, um, daily store revenue by the number of customers that enter the store. Uh, you know, in other words, if someone enters the store, are we gonna have more revenue? Can we tie the two together? Um, and then we can, we can learn how to see which things tie together with this type of, um, uh, of, of modeling. Um, and, you know, and what you'll find in, in, in the case of our example here is that you can actually, if people do come into your store, we can predict revenue. So I do have a correlation between a head count and a, and a revenue forecast. Um, you know, it's really important to understand accuracy here. Again, use common sense here. Uh, uh, there's lots of ways to do regressions, um, but that's the general idea of this type of, um, of uh, model. Um, the next one, uh, near and dear to my heart, because I have had uh, in my professional life 
uh, a lot of uses for classification and clustering, and that's that is where you you um, uh, start to group things into common characteristics and then see how they uh, relate to others. For our example, for um, our the marketing team, you want you you want your marketing team to pay attention to social media for your grocery store. So they might do some type of sentiment analysis and um, and then classify the content of various posts to positive or negative, and then put those into um, some type of uh, model. So we can, t the colors would indicate perhaps the sentiment or a category of something. Then we take a look at uh, the grouping of uh, revenue numbers and then against the cot, you know, the number of items purchased. And here you can see, wow, you know, of course everyone looks at the upper right-hand corner, lower left-hand corner, uh, things like that. Again, remember, this is showing us how things will relate. Now I have to look at this or this data scientist or the business person have to sit down and look at this and then they make their decision um, uh, from, from here. Uh, um, clustering, um, there's a lot of ways you can look at clustering. For our example of the retail chain, you know, suppose we look at the data from a customer rewards program and you see customers items purchased in a year and then the total m money that they spent you can uh, um, you can uh, take that data, um, look at if the rewards program is working. You can see if they're getting uh, some type of rewards feedback. Um, did the targeted promotion work? Should you do more targeted promotions? And the, all of us who have shopped or have a credit card or anything like that, we we get things in the mail. We get little uh, messages on our phone. We log into uh, Amazon to buy something. It tells us something. This is the type of analysis that is 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 uh, making those type of things um, uh, um, come to mind with uh, retailers or anything. And uh, we actually uh, we've talked about something that we use in uh, we actually use a form of this in our practice um, in terms of really large organizations with lots and lots of data requirements. Um, we will cluster. Uh, um, organizations where we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of information requirements or uses of data, we will cluster them by the categories to see where they sit because we might, uh, where this has helped us in the past as using statistical analysis and doing data architecture is in a really, really large enterprise, you you will always be challenged at why do I have to standardize things when my area does its job, leave us alone? And using clustering, you can say your data requirements match 60% of the rest of the organization's data requirements. Therefore, the burden of proof is not on us, the burden of proof is on you. What makes you so different that we have to spend the extra money to have a special architecture for you? And, and, and that's the exact same thing. We've done that type of analysis in our architecture work. So that's why this one's kind of a, a pretty cool, um, a pretty cool example. So from that one, we're going to move into the really cool one, and we save that one for Kelly, and that's predictive analysis. Prescriptive analysis. Did I say predictive again? You did. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I thought mine was cool, but actually, prescriptive <laughs> is prescriptive is much cooler because that um, that pushes a lot of people's thinking too when something says you ought to do something. Right, and that that that's kind of a neat, neat. Uh, there's a neat cultural aspect to that, which we've talked to in our other webinars. But take it away, Kelly, on prescriptive. I got it right that time. Sure. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, oh, am I meant to be advancing these? Sorry, I thought John. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so this is our last category. We are going to take a similar approach as we've done in the previous categories in terms of talking about the most frequently used types of analysis and then providing an example to give you a feel for what this could look like. So uh, as John said, that prescriptive is really what should happen or what should I do. Um, Realistically, you can get some of those answers via descriptive and predictive analysis as well. So it's not to say that 
a prescriptive analysis is the only way to figure out what you should do, but it is a way of using statistical analysis to uh, base it on past performance as what should happen. Um, usually prescriptive analytics uh, it answers explicit questions that you're looking to solve uh, to improve your business, and usually it focuses on maximizing profits or minimizing costs. Um, many of these are done through programming, uh, such as the four examples that we have listed here, but some of these you can do more simply in a more manual way. Uh, so let's just go through and define the four examples that we've got here, and then the next slide will actually show an example of linear programming. Um, linear programming is used to minimize or maximize output, again, usually minimizing costs, maximizing profits, based on multiple variables. So, for example, where you have a limited supply of resources, such as in the next example, our limited amount of resources storage space, maybe it's uh, manufacturing time, assembly time, maybe it's a limited amount of parts, et cetera. Um, each product uses a different amount of resource, and each product uh, provides a different amount of profit. Uh, so in this instance, linear programming, just as its title says, is that all of the variables are actually linear in the way that they are represented. Nonlinear programming is one in which at least one variable is not linear. So it's a just more compl complex way of looking at how those different variables relate to each other uh, and therefore uh, what the prescriptive output would be. Uh, integer program is a subset of linear programming in which at least one of those variables must be an integer or a whole number. So there's some typical use cases for this. For example, capital budgeting uh, is usually using uh, integer programming where you can only order, you know, five or uh, four of the five product options. Sometimes when you're looking at warehousing locations, again, I'm going uh, trying to continue with this retail example. Um, where you must minimize costs associated with transportation between a warehouse or a store location given a specified route. Um, this can be used in scheduling. So let's say you've got 10 salespeople who live in various parts of the city and five stores in different locations around the city. Uh, where do you want to put those salespeople, not just based on their location, but also based on their skill set, um, their training uh, around how they've been trained to sell particular items that are represented, et cetera. And then mixed integer programming is a subset of integer programming where some variables are constrained to be integers and some are not. Again, for typical uh, types of prescriptive data uh, analysis. So we're going to take a minute and go through a linear programming example. And in this example, what we're trying to solve for is that, uh, I guess, rust-colored row at the top. We're trying to determine what is the optimal uh, product quantity to order across our five product lines in order to maximize profit. So our goal is what is that total profit and what is the, the maximization of the profit. In this instance, we've got some constraints. So you'll see below those constraints that we're trying to take into consideration. Each item takes a different amount of storage space. Each item has a different degree of selling effort. So the storage space can be very specific. The selling effort is probably a scale that has been uh, created and, and agreed upon and approved by your stakeholders. Minimum order is bound by the provider of that product or the manufacturer. So in this instance, we're looking at uh, product A provides, uh, has a um, profit per unit of $5. Storage space is um, 0.05, uh, has a low selling effort, so it's 0.25 versus we see that product E has a high selling effort of 7, and it's got a minimum order of 100. So you can see how all of these relate to each other. So within a linear programming example, uh, you can actually solve this by hand or graph uh, to create a graph, and you can then see how that graph extends uh, in order to 
find the um, profit, the maximum profitability per order. Uh, however, it is, of course, much faster to do this using software. So using linear programming software, uh, we can solve for the problem below. And you can see that the linear programming software has given us a solution of ordering the minimum amount for products A and B and C, uh, but for product D, we want to, um, sorry, I'm getting this wrong, the minimum amount for products A and B, we want to maximize our order for product C, and then we're looking at getting the minimum amount for uh, E and D as well. And what we find is that we have a maximum profit for this order of, depending upon the scale, either 14,000 or 14 million dollars. Now, one of the things that this also tells us is that we have some unused storage space. So if we look kind of at the bottom here, uh, on the, towards the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the output of this also tells us that we have used up 852.5 of our storage space when there's 1,000 available. So one of the benefits of this type of programming example is you can actually get additional information that may be helpful in other sorts of decisions. So if you have some leftover warehousing space, maybe there is a different product line that you want to use for that storage space, or maybe you want to use your uh, human analysis to modify this order just slightly to take advantage of that additional storage space. So again, there's the output from the linear programming software that solves for the profitability, and then also taking advantage of some of the additional information that is found as a result of that linear programming example. I think that's back to you, John. Uh, oh, already? Already. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, um, we went through those uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the one thing I wanted to just revisit um, on the predictive, um, and this is where I mentioned something culturally. I, I wanted to come back to that. Um, and I, I think you, you mentioned it was, you know, this type of analysis is the one that's going to say, well, you know, this product is not the most profitable or takes the most space up. Um, or your order quantity is the wrong, so you might want to consider things like cutting the product, not selling the product, outsourcing the product, all kinds of things. And these are the ones that, this is the type of analysis that can, you know, raise eyebrows with a lot of people. The other ones will say, well, you can consider this, you can consider that, and here's the ramifications. This is the analysis that goes, ooh, really? And people will uh, will uh, open their eyes and, and, be, and, and go, I'm not sure we want to do that. Excuse me. So let's kind of just revisit these and do a comparison here for a little bit. And um, we have a few questions uh, that have come in. And please remember that if you do have some questions, um, <clears throat> we will do our best to answer them. And if we don't get them all answered, we will uh, put those um, uh, those answers to uh, paper um, and uh, get those to you um, in, in, the, in the near future. So the most common of our three types here is the descriptive. Um, and uh, oh, I know one of, one of the questions that came in have uh, kind of, uh, uh, we can answer it while we're going through this one here. Um, the best practice here is to perform this at a time. Understand your means, modes, standard deviations. Uh, this is this will help with your hypothesis. This will help with your null or your alternative answers that you're looking for. Um, this is that initial pass someone's going to make at the data, um, uh, uh, and if to see if the, even the data is worth using. Uh, so this is a very important type of analysis that is going to be done. Then after that is um, well, so predictive. Maybe you want to know what could happen if we understand all the variables. Again, uh, or what should we do once we have all the variables understood and we're looking at what it's saying, we run some additional type uh, modeling and it, it tells us uh, based on certain assumptions you should do X or Y. Um, is there a precise step between all three of these? 
no, not really. They can, it's like anything else in this world, there's going to be uh, indistinct borders at times between these. But, but there's uh, three distinct thought processes with these. Really, how much time do you have? Uh, obviously, when you get into predictive and prescriptive, you're going to have to run a model. You're going to have to stage some data in whatever tool might run that, or you're going to have to make sure that the data that you have positioned is visible to uh, some tools. Do you have the right people to run those and understand those? Is the data accurate enough to support your hypothesis, not support the answer, support the hypothesis and support the analysis you're doing. Don't forget, not every, the same data set can support one type of analysis and totally not be able to support another type of analysis. Uh, and that's, uh, again, something that the data scientist or the, the analyst is going to be uh, considering. And when you're supporting those folks or talking to them, a, a good thing to bear in mind that you know one super duper great thing they did a few weeks ago might not be repeatable on another data set. Um, then how popular or accepted is the model? Um, this is where you know if you have a model that says don't sell product C anymore, but product C is the uh, product that uh, great granddad founded the company on, uh, you've got a business dilemma. You have a conundrum now because if something that might be your brand or your visibility isn't really doing anything uh, for you. So subscribing to the that's how we've always done it um, may uh, not work. But on the other hand, then, make sure that your stakeholders are aware of what type of analysis is going to be coming out of some of these models. Uh, these models will give you answers you did not expect. And they will give you answers that you may be uncomfortable uh, with. Um, we've seen this in many, many uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, those of us that travel a lot um, uh, are experiencing um, the, uh, uh, the I, I don't know right the what word for it, the a la cartization of, of, of airfares. And uh, you're going to get charged to put your 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 bag in the overhead uh, if not, you're not getting charged that already. Um, this is a model that came about based on a real keen analysis of data and spending patterns and what people will or pay will not pay for. And again, the results a little uncomfortable for 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 the stakeholders, but you know we'll, we will see what happens. Um, the recent election in the United States had one set of data scientists say it's going to go this way. Another model in another country said it's going to go another way. Um, one model turned out to be right and the other model turned out to be uh, incorrect. So again, common sense, reality, those are the kind of things that we want to bear, bring to bear uh, on, on all of these. So to review, descriptive, what happened? Predictive, what could happen based on a bunch of variables? And then prescriptive, what should happen if all this other stuff happens? Now the difference Someone, one of the questions was, why is clustering not considered descriptive? Well, because clustering is taking a lot of variables into play. It is one of those simulations where I, I have to categorize things and then, and then I can try different categorizations and, and different uh, permutations of the data. Whereas with a descriptive, there's pretty much, you're taking it as is, where is, and then in describing some, well, that's why it's called descriptive. You're describing characteristics of that statistical sample. So that's why it's, it's, that's why the clustering is not put in the descriptive category, why it's put in the um, uh, predictive uh, category. Uh, let's see here. What's, uh, Kelly, I think you're, you time yeah, to so come off. Go ahead. Yeah, so before you go on to this slide, I think sure. another thing just to consider is that you don't have to use these in isolation. And so we did talk about how descriptive can be a foundation to validate um, what your, uh, what information you have. Uh, can you do a more complex model? But predictive uh, and forecasting could be fed into, so the output of a predictive model could be fed into a prescriptive model, right? So it's not that you would be using 
either or, it has to be one versus the other, but there's there might be benefits in the way that you integrate these different sorts of models to either provide that additional information in terms of you know what could versus what should happen, but to get to that next level of granularity. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to highlight on this slide. And then the second thing, just to add to what you were saying, John, is that this last bullet point I think is very important. And it's not just making sure that you have validated with your stakeholders that there is a resonance and a consensus around the output, but that the model that you're using or the way that you're getting to the output is accepted. So this could be because of a level of understanding, this could be because of a level of inputs that go into it, but it's just as important to ensure that you have agreement that the model is valid and meaningful in the same way that once you get the output in order to action a decision, you need to get agreement and consensus around the output of the model as well. That's very all good. I wanted to add. Really very good. Well, let's uh, just we'll stay on uh, open here and we'll uh, give our uh, audience some takeaways. and. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for listening here. Uh, we do have time for some questions, and we probably have some room for a few more, I think. I haven't looked at the la list in the last minute or two, but it seemed there was. Um, and um, and thank you, everyone, for, for hanging in there. Uh, it's, it's a nice, really good turnout here, and we really appreciate it, and we hope we're, we're uh, helping. Key takeaways today. Um, you have to plan this out. Uh, Kelly was just kind of talking about that. Um, uh, you have to have some awareness and uh, and consistency on how you do these things. Um, it isn't uh, there's a perception out there that the data scientist just dives in and some miracle occurs. It's no, it's there's a discipline. There's there is science going on here. Um, there is not a replacement for common sense though. Um, don't don't just take everything for face value. Uh, we had a client a few years ago. Who, and this is an example I gave in one of our first talks. The initial recommendation was uh, close all the branch off, no, close some huge percentage of branch offices. And it turns out that was driven by uh, uh, an incorrect assumption on data that someone didn't use common sense. Um, so, you know, you have to be careful. You have to use uh, some, some common sense here. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there on this stuff, but the key when you're looking to help understand is the word applied statistics. If you run down to the local university and grab a 400 level statistics course book, um, if it were me, my head would explode. Um, you need to look at uh, some so things that are applied uh, and, and gives you some good examples. Big data is not required. Data insight, it's an analytics, uh, the name of our webinar here, it covers big data, but uh, you can use this stuff with little data. One of the questions um, that came in uh, here, Kelly, is someone would like some examples of tools that do the three types of data. Now, any of your uh, long-term statistical tool suites, which are well-known, so I'm not advertising for anybody here, SPSS, SAS, right? They work in big data environments. They work in uh, um, middle and small data environments. They have the ability to do all of these, these things uh, and are priced and configured in various ways. But your your uh, your Alteryx uh, and other types of tools also have big chunks of functionality that cross all of these as well. Uh, when you're looking at them and picking them, uh, looking at the type of models you want to run is a big criteria for your evaluation of these things. A basic understanding of statistical. Don't forget that Excel is a is a useful statistical oh, tool too. <laughs> silly me. Yes, actually, you know, if you wanted just to start to play with this stuff, yes, Excel. You uh, you can smooth curves. You can do exponential smoothing, logarithmic smoothing. Um, uh, you can do all kind of plotting. You can do clustering uh, in Excel. Uh, if you really get fancy, you can download. Uh, or purchase uh, a macros that will go, go on top of Excel to do some even more sophisticated stuff. Uh, there's a lot uh, out there that you can, you know, 
and I mean, in the old days, and I'm dating myself, you know, you could you could put too much data in your in your PC and and things tools wouldn't work. Nowadays, there's a whole lot more data you can stuff in there on your desktop and and, and go crazy. Um, and I, I guess Kelly, you can weigh in on on this one here. A basic understanding of statistic goes a long way. As we were putting this material together, Kelly and I had to revisit some some stuff that we had done in the past and had um, uh, done a little bit of it. And it's been a few years since you did it, and or you heard it in college and you never got back to it. Or or I worked with some people for example, that did all of that and listened to them and saw their results, but it's been a long time since I myself sat down and did something like this. And re the re refreshing our awareness was invaluable for for this particular topic and for the whole data insights and analytics topic, right? I mean, it really helped expand the, the, the vision of how this stuff is going to be used and then how do we support it and how do we get the data in the right place to do it. it. It was a great refresher for us uh, as well. Um, here's some examples. We have a bibliography, uh, statistics in plain English, uh, when predictive models fails, a tech target uh, topic out there, and a podcast uh, on uh, statistics, um, proving that there's a podcast on just about anything, I guess, nowadays. <laughs> um, so there's some uh, other sources for you uh, to consider. Kelly, anything to add here before we uh, take a look at the questions? No, I think that this is all really good. And uh, um, I do think that we did cover a lot here. So there probably are a bunch of questions that we could go through. And of course, anything that we don't get through uh, live, we will answer uh, in written format. Sure. Well, here is so I wanted to just pop in. Um, uh, data analysis or data analytics, is there a difference and which is the correct one? That's an interesting question. I think analytics, data analytics is more a label of the discipline and perhaps data analysis is a label for a process. That's how I would view it. Kelly, a thought on that? Yep, I would agree with that. I think that that's a good way to think about it. Yep, yep. I think uh, the implication is that analysis tends to feel more simplistic versus analytics is the bigger, fancier picture. But I think that that's accurate, John. One is more of a practice and the other is more of a process. Yeah, and, and I think, and, and, and this is a really well-timed question, uh, because there is a, uh, um, and, and this just happens in all human endeavors, you know, labels get assigned and then there's an impression with the label. Um, you know, someone who is a data analyst or someone who does data analytics, the, the impression might be that the latter is a much more sophisticated, smarter, more highly paid person, but the reality might be they're identical. Uh, the reality might be it's reversed, and the my, reality might be, yeah, it is a much more sophisticated. It, it just depends on things. Uh, the takeaway there is... Uh, look underneath the label and look at what they're doing. Are they running these types of models? Are they just moving the data? Are they maybe just doing descriptive models uh, and, and coming up with some relatively simple understanding of the data versus moving it up the curve? Um, so uh, good question. Uh, I think it is to you know, keep, keep the functionality and what you're doing and what the intended results and what you're gonna do with the results are really the important considerations before before uh, the label there. Uh, let's see, we have another question here. Um, uh, Data-driven versus data-informed, big deal or not? I'll take, you can have that one, Kelly, to start. Um, I think that those, well, my opinion, are those are levels of maturity and some organizations need to pass through data informed before they can be data driven. So in my view, the difference between the two is that the first is that we are using data to make decisions. We are using data to uh, identify trends. So we are using data many times to validate a hypothesis that we're making without data. 
data driven is we are proactively incorporating data into all decision making processes and we are not making a decision until we actually do some data analysis so it's a it's just a difference between using data to inform decisions versus using data to truly drive decisions so it's a nuance but i would say that there is a difference and it's mainly a cultural difference and likely a maturity and progression yeah, I, I think it's a good, um, uh, I think data-driven um, uh, and data-informed are kind of shades of maturity. Um, both of them require a certain acceptance of, of models. It's, it's, it's similar to uh, the predictive versus the uh, prescriptive uh, acceptance of that. Um, but um, they, it is a shade of maturity. Not to say that you have to, I'm not so sure about going through one before you get to the other, um, uh, but um, there might be a way to go directly, you know, from point A to point C, but definitely a, a good way to uh, subtly, the difference between someone who's really, really going to build data into everything and, or just will consider it as, as they see fit. Um, at that point, we're out of time for the questions. We're at the top of the hour here. Um, and in a moment, I'll turn it back to uh, Shannon, but please join us uh, in a month for the next uh, webinar, Building a Flexible and Scalable Analytics Architecture. And in that one, we're going to be throwing up some punch lists for architecture and some ideas for you for a reference architecture uh, that is broad spectrum all the way from your uh, traditional uh, type um, uh, uh, BI um, all the way to the to the more sophisticated big data type uh, things. So uh, we look forward to presenting that material to you, Shannon. Uh, uh, Kelly, anything to add, or we'll turn it back over to Shannon. All right. Well, thank you, Joan and Kelly, so much for this another great presentation. I just a reminder for everyone: I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session and anything uh, else that was requested. Uh, it looks like we got through all the questions, but we'll just do another quick scrub of those. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and just asking all the great questions. We appreciate it so much. And I hope everyone has a great day. Again, John and Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Talk to you in a month. Bye-bye. Ciao.